Perfect. Thank you very much, Gina. Uh, welcome, everyone, to today's webinar, Clinical Deterioration, What Can I Do? Uh, my name is Jason Thompson, Communications Officer with the Canadian Patient Safety Institute. Apology, apologies for the delay this morning, and thank you very much for sticking with us. Um, before we get into the call itself, just a couple of housekeeping items. First, I'd like to introduce uh, a couple of members of the CPSI team who helped put this together. Uh, the first one you've heard already, Gina Peck. She's our project coordinator and uh, technical host. So thank you very much, Gina, for helping us navigate all the technical issues. Uh, also, we have Carla Williams, who's the patient safety improvement lead on the deteriorating patient condition uh, portfolio here at CPSI. Uh, so thanks very much to Carla for helping to put this together. So today's webinar, as I mentioned, is called Clinical Deterioration, What Can I Do? Well, a couple of things come to mind. First off, listen to this webinar. So that's a great start by everyone on the line. Secondly, you can all visit patientsafetyinstitute.ca, and if you enter the letters DPC for deteriorating patient condition into the search bar, this is the easiest way to access a ton of information curated by the Canadian Patient Safety Institute, the Healthcare Insurance Reciprocal of Canada, and Patients for Patient Safety Canada. And it's all segmented, whether you're a member of the public, a healthcare provider, or a healthcare leader. So it's really easy to find all the information that's relevant to you. But we'll touch a little bit more on what we have online later on. Throughout the call, please feel free to submit your questions via the chat box throughout the presentation and indicate who you're addressing your questions to if possible. We'll collect them and have time for a quick Q&A once all of the presenters have gone. Now let's meet our speakers for today. First up will be Donna Davis. Donna has worked as a nurse for 41 years in a variety of healthcare settings and is currently the Community Health Services Manager at Gainesboro Health Centre in Saskatchewan. She is a past co-chair and current member of Patients for Patient Safety Canada. Donna developed the Patient and Family Advisory Council in her health region and is a passionate advocate for including the patient and family perspective in healthcare. Her passion for patient safety stems from the experience of losing her 19-year-old son. The next speaker will be Joanna Noble, who is the Supervisor of Knowledge Transfer within the Health Risk Management Department at the Healthcare Insurance Reciprocal of Canada. She leads the translation of claims data into patient safety knowledge and the dissemination of this knowledge to healthcare organizations, practitioners, and other stakeholders. 2016, Joanna was selected to be a member of the Canadian Patient Safety Institute's Knowledge Translation and Implementation Science faculty. Following Joanna will be Dr. Michael Milliton, who is a staff intensivist and respirologist at William Osler Health System in Toronto. He has served as the medical director of critical care at William Osler and has implemented rapid response teams in two large community hospitals. Dr. Milliton currently serves as the critical care lead for the Central West Local Health Integration Network. Finally, we have Sabina Robin, patient safety champion and member of Patients for Patient Safety Canada. Sabina has worked as a licensed practical nurse for the last 20 years in rural, urban, and community settings. Sabina got involved with patient safety after losing her fourth child, Matea, in April of 2004, following a series of communication breakdowns during a nine-day hospitalization that contributed to Matea's death. Without further ado, we'll get started with the call, so we'll pass things over to Donna Davis. Hi, I just want to make sure everyone can hear me. Yes, we can hear you, Donna. Please proceed. Perfect. Welcome to everyone across Canada. I see by the screen there is 109 approximately that are on this webinar, so welcome and thank you very much for taking the time out of your busy day to learn more about the deteriorating patient and what you can do to recognize and prevent further deterioration that can and has ended in a tragic outcome. Thank you to CPSI also for inviting me to speak on a subject that is so important to me and my family and to the many families and patients and staff who have experienced those tragic outcomes. As the parents of four children, my husband and I had been through the usual bumps and bruises, broken bones, concussions, and the myriad of illnesses that you come to expect with having children. With our oldest child having high-level spina bifida, we had had multiple interactions with the healthcare system, and with me being a nurse, well, let's just say I thought I knew the healthcare system inside and out. That all changed when our 19-year-old son Vance had a single vehicle crash in the early hour, in, pardon me, in the early hours of the morning on March 27, 2002. 
After calling the RCMP three times to come help him, he walked away from the accident seeking shelter as it was very cold at that time of year. We're in Saskatchewan. In the morning, the RCMP informed us of the accident and that Vance could not be found. After a 36-hour search, we did find Vance in a vacant house trailer four miles from the scene of the accident. He was laying on a bed with his blood-covered cell phone in his hand. He was semi-conscious with an obvious head injury. He was sent to our nearest ER and from there to a tertiary care center. Although still very worried about him and exhausted, his dad and I, we thought that we could breathe easy now. He was in a big city hospital where the experts would care for him and everything would be all right, except it wasn't. The first day at the hospital, Vance was confused, slept a lot, but would rouse when spoken to and seemed to know us, although he never called us by name, nor did he call his sister and our close family friend by name. He would say things like, where's my truck? I'll be okay. We were told his injury was just a little worse than a concussion, but he would be fine. It was a minor injury that would take time and rest. The next day, Vance appeared to me to not be doing as well. He was very irritable when roused. It took more to get him to rouse. He complained of more pain. He didn't open his eyes, and he said, I'm blind, I can't see. His pulse had dropped to 50. It had been around 70, 75 when he was admitted. I mentioned these things to the nurse and was told, he's young and he's in good shape, that's why his pulse is 50. He's just tired, that's why he doesn't rouse as easily. And the lights in here, the surgical intensive care unit where he was admitted, are very bright. That's why he doesn't open his eyes. He can't see if his eyes aren't open, I remember her telling me. I told the nurse I was uncomfortable with his condition. It seemed to be getting worse, not better. And I know not very many hours had passed, but enough hours that I could see a change. He wasn't getting better. I asked about a repeat CT scan just to see if there had been any change. It's just a minor injury, we were told again. We only do CT scans if they are necessary, and it isn't necessary. This is just a minor injury. In fact, we are moving him to the ward, she said at that time. And in approximately two hours, they sat him up to begin moving him to the ward. He grabbed his head and started crying and moaning. And I remember him saying, my head is going to explode. He started retching and vomiting. And the nurse said, well, I guess we won't move him now. We'll try later. And again, I expressed my concern to her. And her response was to send a social worker to see me as she felt I wasn't handling Vance's injury very well. And being a nurse, I was very, very subtle and respectful and made my suggestions very quietly. I certainly did not want to alienate the people that were looking after Vance. The social worker, um, she said she thought I had valid concerns and understood the concerns and fears I had. Vance continued to become less responsive. I asked to speak to a doctor, but was told they were too busy. It's just a minor injury. It will take time and rest. We heard that over and over again. One nurse was chuckling as she told me that the evening before, on Friday, Vance had asked her if he was going to die. She told him, not on my watch. The next day, Sunday, when I went back to the hospital in the morning, Vance did not look well to me. He did not rouse when spoken to. He occasionally opened his eyes when I begged him to. I wanted a sign that his Glasgow was good. But my heart, the sick feeling in the pit of my stomach and my mother's intuition was telling me otherwise. I was filled with dread and fear. My son was slipping away. Why was I, why was I the only one that could see it? And now his pulse was 37. He was having periods of apnea. I mentioned this to the nurse and I was told he's doing what deep sea divers do. He is practicing holding his breath. I was astonished. I couldn't believe that. And I questioned her, what does that have to do with someone who's had a head injury? And she said, well, we see it all the time. The intensivist came in and did his rounds, and I was asked to leave the room. When he came out of the room, he said to the nurse as they strided past me, he's just being stubborn. He won't cooperate. And I wanted to jump up and say, there's something wrong. It's not that he won't cooperate with you. It's that he can't. Something is going wrong. 
but I didn't. Again, I didn't want to alienate the staff. These were the experts out in rural Saskatchewan and Manitoba where I've nursed my whole career. We send people with injuries like this to the experts. Who was I to question? I did ask to speak to the doctor, but I was told not now, maybe after rounds, but that didn't happen. And Vance's alarms went off all day. The nurses came in and shut them off but I never once saw anyone look at Vance. They would just come in, shut off the alarms, and leave. By now, I'm telling anyone that comes into his room that I'm so scared for our son. I saw a couple from our hometown. They asked how Vance was, and I remember saying to them, he's not doing well, he's getting worse, but no one will listen to me. At 10 that night, he was moved to the ward. I couldn't believe they were moving him with his vitals being the way they were. As soon as I saw him once he was settled in the ward, I knew that something had changed drastically, and I told the nurse that. She did a sternal rub. There was no response. She tried to give him an oral analgesic. I'm not really sure why, because to me, he was comatose. The tablet sat on his lip. The water she gave him pooled in the V of his neck. Why was Vance invisible to this care provider? I had, or he had a seizure. And I mentioned that to her. I was alarmed, and she said, it's just a tremor. I disagreed. I said, no, that's a seizure. He's having a seizure. It was down one side. She insisted it was a tremor. And it stopped, and she said, see, it was just a tremor. And eventually, I went back to the hotel. That's where I was staying, because we live three and a half hours away from the hospital. I, I had the sense that I was in the way, so I left to go back to the hotel. But before I left, I asked for reassurance that they would keep a close eye on Vance. Check him often, I said, please check him often. I'm so afraid for him. I was assured they would. At 3 a.m., I got the call. Vance had crashed and he was going to CT. A doctor came to speak to me. It was a different doctor than the doctor that had admitted him to, ICE, to SICU. And he quickly, that doctor in the ER had very quickly assessed him while he was sedated with Versed. I presume he looked at his CT scan, but um, knowing what the CT scan said, I don't know how they could have said it was a minor injury. And when this doctor came to see me I, and told me his condition was very grave, I asked him, why haven't they been listening to me? He's been going downhill for three days and no one would listen to me. And the doctor turned to the nurse who happened to be the same nurse who said that Vance wasn't going to die. And he said, what is she talking about? I've been on this ward every day for the last three days and nobody has asked me to see this young man. And she just shrugged and said, well, she's had some concerns over the last few days. So they were going to operate, um, but then they didn't because he had purposeful movements after receiving mannitol. Within a short time, I saw Vance deteriorate again. He had what I believe was a catecholamine response. His BP was 250 over 180. His pulse was 159. His neck started turning purple, spreading up to his face. I believe his brain herniated at that time, and our vibrant, hardworking, brilliant, blue-eyed son was gone from us forever. And then for the first time, I demanded that a doctor be called and they do something to save my son but it was too late. After Vance died and we got his chart months later, we were dismayed to see that after I left the hospital that night, he had not been checked on for one and a half hours. At that time, he had stenorous breathing, was unresponsive, his Glasgow was six, and no doctor was called. We now know that the sending nurse gave Vance a Glasgow of 14 when he was transferred to the ward, a score that I certainly question with a pulse of 37 and not opening his eyes and everything else that I mentioned. Uh, the receiving nurse in, on the ward assessed him as having a Glasgow of 6 when care was transferred to her. As most of us know, a Glasgow of 3 to 8 indicates the patient is in a coma and no doctor was called at this significant change at the time of the transfer. And no doctor was called an hour and a half later when she checked him after I went home. And then we further found out by reading his chart that Vance wasn't checked on again for more than two hours. Now he was in respiratory distress, was having seizures, and his Glasgow was three. 
Vance was brain dead from a minor injury that was just going to take time and rest. How could this happen? How could a mother's concern be discounted? How could the person who knew him best be disregarded? And how could this obvious deterioration be overlooked? I still ask this today, but today I feel hopeful, I feel optimistic, and I have faith, I need to have faith that the recognition of the deteriorating patient and recognition of the important contribution of the loved ones at the bedside, the ones we who know this person best, in recognizing the subtle and sometimes like Vance, the not so subtle signs of deterioration, our contribution is so important to helping the staff recognize that. Six years after Vance's death, we talked to the health region about what happened, or rather what didn't happen in Vance's incident. Three dedicated people in the region where his, events, his event happened developed a patient warning system they named Vance's stop sign. It is a stop the line system in the two ERs in the city where a flashing stop sign is placed on the ER patient tracking board to notify that there is a concern that needs to be addressed before the patient has a significant procedure, is transferred, or discharged. Any staff member can initiate the stop sign. Family members can express their concern to staff, and then the staff initiate the stop sign. It hasn't been spread to other wards, but I really hope it will be, especially after hearing how Dartmouth General Hospital in Nova Scotia has taken Vance's stop sign and made it their own on their 36-bed med surge ward. It is in its infancy there, um, just being in place since July. But the system was introduced to staff and phys physicians together so that they were all on the same page and understood what the goal of this new system was, and that is to recognize and act on concerns regarding patients. Feedback from staff indicates that just having the system in place has made them more aware of the deteriorating patient, and it gives them permission to make that call to the, to the physician, knowing that the doctor knows and supports the system in place. If anyone wants to learn more about either of these systems, I can put you in touch with the facilities, I'm sure. Um, sharing our improvements in patient safety is so important from coast to coast and really all around the world. Failure to rescue is number two in healthcare claims. It is obviously an area that requires dedicated, deliberate study and resources and that is what prompted CPSI and High Rock to collaborate with others, including Sabina Robin, who you'll hear shortly, a mother and Patients for Patient Safety Canada member who lost her infant daughter when Matea's deteriorating condition wasn't recognized in time to save her life. You will hear from Sabib, Sabina, the early warning resources developed to help recognize and respond to clinical deteriorating patients before it is too late before beautiful infants and hard-working, loving sons slip from our lives much too soon. I'd like to thank everyone who worked on these resources to make every patient safe. Thank you, and enjoy the rest of the webinar. Thank you very much, Donna, uh, for your bravery in telling your story. I think it serves as a sobering reminder as to why this topic is so important. With that, we'll call upon Joanna Noble uh, with the Healthcare Insurance Reciprocal of Canada to take the ball and uh, present on, uh, on why deteriorating patient condition is an issue. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Donna, for sharing Vance's story. This is, I mean, it really is why we are here today. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about how the story is continuing. We are listening, we are hearing that clinical deterioration is a top-ranked risk for healthcare organizations. So we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, the formation of a collaboration and talk a little bit about um, some of the tools before I hand this over to Sabina. Sorry, just some technical difficulties here. If I can go back to the previous slide, is that possible? Okay, a little bit about uh, Hiroc Claims Database. We have one of the largest claims databases in Canada, if not the largest. And, and what we do is that we take the learnings from such claims and we rank them based on claims cost. What we know about claims data, it's not a good source in terms of frequency. 
uh, in part uh, due to what is required in terms of reporting to HEROC. So what is reported to HEROC is generally the catastrophic cases, so those are the cases that are really tip of the iceberg, so we don't get those near misses. So what we do with this data is that we um, rank it by claims cost. You can see our, our diagram there. So we have what we call our top 30 ranked risks. And these top 30 ranked risks make it up 84% of the total incurred cost. So what we did for every single identified risk is that we developed risk reference sheets. So they're two-page practical resources that outline the key issues, mitigation strategies, and some case studies. So what became evident um, is that uh, patient deterioration is one of our top ranked risks. So back in 2011, we undertook the first risk ranking exercise. And uh, patient deterioration ranked at that time number 10. So we re-ranked it several years later, about three years later, and it jumped up to number two. So we're a bit surprised at that, um, but perhaps we shouldn't have been. Now, what you see on this graph or in this table is that patient deterioration is not just something specific to acute care. So we can see it is the second highest ranked risk for home care, number three for community health, number 10 for mental health, number 12 for nursing personal care homes, and number 12 for complex continuing care. So you can see that this is, this is a top ranked risk for a professional liability insurance that's called PureRock. So a colleague of mine um, had the opportunity to actually present some of this information a couple years ago uh, during Patient Safety Week, which we'll get into in a couple of minutes. Um, but in terms of what we actually saw in our claims database, what we see is a lot of these cases involve almost um, a loss of the big picture when it comes to the clinical scenario. So, for example, you might think it's a couple of minutes, but really it's been 24 minutes and that patient continues to deteriorate. We also see a lot, a lot of cases where uh, what one, one would consider the abnormal becomes the normal. So they almost normalize. And I think we heard that earlier um, in Donna's story when the practitioner said, well, we see that all the time. So they almost become numb to the abnormal. So we see in a lot of our cases there's concerns about the patient or the family um, they will bring forward their concerns, but it's not acted on. Um, and then we know in a lot of these cases that they were um, very aware of that deterioration. It might have been subtle, but the family knew best. We also see cases where staff were very hesitant to escalate care concerns where there's actually disagreement in terms of whether or not there was actually a deterioration. So, Two years ago, after my colleague Polly presented at the Patient Safety uh, at the, the, the Canadian Patient Safety Week, um, we realized right away that a collaboration was to be formed. What we knew at that time is that it had to be co-led by families and patients, and it was perfect timing um, during our conversations with CPSI and their movement towards uh, shift to safety. We thought perhaps that could be the platform in terms of. Um, bringing forward uh, increased awareness of patient deterioration, but also in terms of the tools and resources. So what we did is that we hired a professional librarian to do a in-depth analysis of peer-reviewed journals, you know, gray and white literature. Um, we curated and synthesized the information. And what we were looking for were tools and resources um, for families, for clinicians, and for leaders, rather than reinvent the wheel. Um, the tools and resources were really focused on proactive detection and notification rather than response. The tools that we looked at had to be practical, evidence-based where possible, and credible. At the same time, we engaged in ongoing conversations with experts across North America in terms of what worked really well in terms of uh, rapid response teams or fairly activated teams. So we are lucky enough to uh, provide feedback to HSO's latest standards for critical care and for inpatient standards. So you can see some of the wording um, that they in the current standing in its current standards. So I'm going to end it there and hand that over to Michael. Hi, um, I'm hoping everyone can hear me. Uh, good afternoon and. Um, Thank you for uh, joining this call, and uh, thank you to uh, previous two speakers, um, 
it was really both very enlightening. I'm going to take you through a um, number of slides. Um, I'm going to wrap, take about 20 minutes just to go through a little bit of what we've done in, in um, our hospital in Northwest uh, Toronto um, to address some of the concerns uh, we've, we've heard about. Wanted to advance my slide here. Here we go. So, uh, I'm going to talk about early warning systems, and uh, these were, have already been touched on by our, our two previous speakers. To tell you a little bit how uh, we came up with this concept and, and operationalized it, and uh, some of the uh, outcomes we've seen uh, after we deployed these in uh, two fairly large uh, community hospitals uh, in Toronto. So, we know that. Um, in our ICUs, many ICUs, about 30% of 30% of our admissions come from the wards. And uh, when that happens, uh, we recognize that these are our sickest patients. These are patients who are sent to the ward with perhaps a, a lower level of illness, uh, perhaps a higher level of illness, in fact, that was not recognized, or, or something else has happened, perhaps a therapeutic misadventure, perhaps uh, things have not evolved in the way that the care providers expected maybe um, patients did not respond to treatment as expected for many reasons. And we know that those patients have doubled the mortality rate of our patients coming to the ICU out of the operating room, certainly, or, or from the emergency department. And these are for all comers. When we look at people who actually have a cardiac arrest on, on the ward, the ultimate bad outcome for a hospitalized patient, um, the uh, outcomes are uh, extremely dismal. We see survival to dis hospital discharge about 13%, and of those survivors, about 50% have severe disability, or have disability, and about a quarter have severe disability afterwards. So the outcomes are dismal. But we know that the warning signs prior to a cardiac arrest are almost always present, and they are not subtle. Of those war patients coming to the ICU, about 80% have SERS criteria. So their heart rate is elevated, their respiratory rate is elevated, they have a temperature or they're hypothermic, their white count is elevated or in fact uh, quite low. The other 20% have alterations in their level of consciousness and alteration in their GCS. And vital signs are the key to making this diagnosis. The most important vital sign is the least accurately reported, if it's reported at all, and, and that would be the respiratory rate, um, giving us an insight into both the cardio, cardiac function and respiratory function. So, you know, this is not a new problem, obviously, and, and over the last 10, 15 years uh, across North America, um, many hospitals have de deployed uh, critical care response teams or MET teams, race teams, many different uh, acronyms there. And this is a famous uh, graph uh, coming from the Australians who pioneered this work, showing that the more MET calls or medical emergency teams, uh, medical emergency calls you have per 1,000 missions, the bigger the reduction in your uh, risk of cardiac arrest on the wards. So this is an issue of dose. So the more rapid response team activity you have, the more calls are being made uh, by nurses or other providers or families on the ward, the better your hospital outcome. So these teams work, but they, they've got to be activated somehow. So uh, there was a large study in 2005 uh, uh, that was negative, the merit trial from Australia. So these, again, were the lead proponents of, of uh, MET or CCRTs. Um, they did all the pioneer, pioneering work. They did a large randomized trial and they didn't show a study between, they didn't show a, sorry, a difference between hospitals that had a team and hospitals that didn't. The outcomes were the same. And they were wondering why, why, why did this happen? And in the end, a couple of the main reason was really that um, the hospitals that had uh, CCRT or MET teams um, simply didn't have those teams activated enough. When they looked back and said, okay, so what is the, um, how good are our calling criteria? So nurses are educated on the words to call. If, if vital signs are abnormal, the patient looks unwell. If the patient has a decreased level of consciousness, a seizure, et cetera. Well, those, the sensitivity of those criteria are only 50%. And those are criteria that are used now around the world. So half the time, um, the a call is not made or the illness is not picked up by using those criteria. So 
to have uh, sensitivity get higher, you, you have to have those criteria present. You have to recognize the criteria, and the call actually has to be made. So if the patient was sick, but the call wasn't made by the care provider on the ward, that counted as a missed call. So uh, to borrow from our cardiology colleagues, time is tissue. So we know that from multiple studies from around the world now, so increasing time between the calling criteria met, let's say a very high heart rate or for a high respiratory rate, from the time of that criteria is first documented to the time that the rapid response scene uh, is activated, the longer the time, the higher the uh, mortality rate for the patient. Non-activation of the CCRT for patients meeting calling criteria is also associated with increased mortality. So if nobody calls at all, you end up with code blue or near certain death. If nobody calls for a while, you have a higher risk of ICU admission and a higher risk of death as well. So you know this led to uh, editorials and articles with, uh, with titles like that. The Rapid Response Team Paradox, Why Does Anyone Call for Help? by Michael Boyce, one of the uh, pioneers of Rapid Response Team. Um, so CCRT activation depends on, you know, the accuracy of staff observation, the judgment, their judgment of the patient's condition, diligence in the measurement of vital signs, and calling for help in a timely fashion. I mean, just circling back to what Joanna had mentioned in one of her slides, exactly the same, same message. So, you know, we've got these great teams out, but are they being optimized or not? So how do we optimize it? So we need to we considered improving the import, the performance of the signal arm and hardwiring it by using a, a forcing function in a way. And that, that's really early warning systems in a nutshell. Getting the signal to the provider. Why don't ward staff call more often? I mean, the patients are complex, they're sick. Uh, we heard about alarm fatigue, turning the alarm off and not paying attention to the patient. So there's a lot of nuisance alarms out there, and uh, it becomes a you know, cry-wolf scenario sometimes to the detriment of patients. Uh, busy ward environment, nurses are looking after multiple patients, doing multiple tasks, and suffering some, some cognitive overload and fatigue. And, and you know, admittedly, the ward physician expertise uh, and availability is variable, uh, depending where you go. You know, we heard back from our clinicians and that, you know, we, we don't need a computer to tell us uh, or an algorithm to tell us who's sick. Um, you know, we, we know I can, I can tell what a sick patient looks like, physicians, nurses tell us. And that's true to, to a degree, but sometimes we forget to use our intuition. Again, when we're doing many, many different tasks, when we have a lot of distractions, sometimes uh, our intuition is uh, not helping us. So if we use a, an algorithm with intuition, maybe we're further ahead. So I mentioned that 80% of our patients we know that, that end up coming to the ICU have service criteria. Um, and, and those criteria, those abnormal vital signs are present about a day uh, before admission. These are, you know, when we first started thinking about um, an early warning system, I thought, boy, we know we're gonna get an alert and we're gonna be running to the patient's bedside. And sometimes we run, but sometimes we walk because those vital signs, those vital signs that are abnormalities uh, are there for a full day before a bad outcome occurs on average. So you've got some time, time to, to think and, uh, and measure your response. Um, so one approach, um, vital signs, many hospitals now enter their vital signs into uh, hospital EMR or um, uh, computer system, often this is done by a nurse. Sometimes it's done by a remote system, often it's done right right at the uh, at the computer workstation and in the, into the electronic medical record. And many of these systems uh, can be programmed fairly simply, in fact, to run a checklist and say, okay, we're putting those vital signs into the computer. Um, if the vital signs are abnormal, um, and we will define what abnormal is, tell us about it and generate an alert. So, you know, a human brain is not good at integrating a lot of pieces of information and making a big picture. Sometimes we have difficulty with lots of chunks of data, but a computer has no problem doing that. Um, sometimes we miss the forest for the trees, but if we create um, 
if we tell the computer, look, this, these, these uh, combination of abnormal vital signs equals a sick patient, it's fairly easy for, the, uh, for a programmer to, to do and easy for an alert to be created. So you can design an algorithm to be very sensitive, so pick up everybody who might be sick, but a lot of them are, will be false positives, meaning you know, pick up everybody with a high heart rate and a, a high-ish respiratory rate. Most of those patients on the ward will never end up in the ICU or co have a code blue that will eventually go home. Um, but you'll know about everybody who could be sick. Or you can make it very specific, meaning you'll miss a lot of those false pauses, but, um, and, and you'll miss some real ones, but the signal you'll get are only the very sick patients. So you can do it one of two ways. And the way you set the characteristics of, of, your, of your alert is determined by who's going to be accountable for those vital signs, who's going to respond to them. So a lot of both, like this is a growing literature in early warning, lots of both and papers and saying, well, we've got the best system and no, we have, and um, which uh, a lot of literature, a lot of time, money's been spent on creating or people looking for what's the best way to set these algorithms. What is the best combination of vital signs that are going to predict that outcome for a ward patient? And there's about 20 or so out there, and which one is best, I don't really know. They're all, they all work about the same. They're, they're, when you look at the performance characteristics area under the curve at the AUC, is somewhere around 80%. Uh, none of them are terrible and none of them are perfect. But I think what really matters is you want to match the alert you select to the level of, of accountability. Um, and I'll get back to that in a moment. So when you look at what's been done in uh, early warning literature today in terms of outcomes, there's not a lot of outcome literature out there. Um, and most of them are before or after designs. There's no real randomized trials out there at this point. Um, one before or after design, a large one, 18,000 patients uh, on two continents. Uh, use vital sign monitors at the bedside to send their vital signs. The nurse would put in the vital signs into the monitor, send it to the EMR, uh, and then the monitors would, would calculate an early warning score based on the vitals. So if your vitals are really abnormal, the score would be high. If they were less abnormal, the score would really be lower. Above a certain threshold of a score, you know, they get a, a flashing uh, on their monitor saying, you know, so this is a sick patient. Please call the rapid response team. Please call the physician, et cetera. What they found was, you know, the vital signs got done faster. Uh, patients who had a rapid response team call had improved survival uh, in the post-implementation phase. Uh, they were less likely to have uh, to, to die on the ward. They had more calling of the rapid response team uh, and a trend to decrease in cardiac arrest. So that, that was kind of a nice proof of concept. Uh, a more recent study, again, a before after the design, this time in the UK, a smaller study, about 2,000 patients. Um, and, they, and when they did the same kind of thing, they found more rapid response team tendency in the after phase. So, um, you know, put the vital signs into a monitor, the monitor spits back an alert if the vital signs are very abnormal in combination and tells you, you know, what to call the rapid response team, and that's what happened. Uh, overall, a decrease in hospital mortality, decrease in code blues, decrease in severity of illness at the time of ICU admission. So, presumably, the rapid response team is getting to patients earlier in their sickness and not in the last moment. We, we know that that can often be uh, sometimes even futile. Uh, and an increase in the number of patients with DNR over. So, um, you know, sometimes the rapid response team will come up or physicians will come up and talk to the patient, talk to the family, and they will need an appropriate, uh, you know, uh, level of care or uh, an end-of-life uh, care plan uh, if, if appropriate. So when we set the uh, when we set our sensitivities and specificities of our alerts, you know, if if you want to make a very sensitive alert, meaning pick up everybody who might be sick, the alert will typically come to the ward team because that's manageable. If every ward takes care of their own alerts, you know, on an average ward we found about 30 patients probably get about six alerts per day, so that means three per shift. Um, we send those alerts to the charge nurse who then is responsible for checking up on those patients with the bedside nurse and then deciding on the response in a scalable fashion. If you choose a more specific alert, just targeting the very sick patients, that alert can go to the rapid response team. Again, the rapid response team is not going to be able to respond to you know, six alerts per day per ward. If you've got a big hospital with lots of wards, it's going to overwhelm them. 
So the way you set your alerts depends on who's going to be getting them. And that's really the bottom line message from, from this talk. Um, at William also where I work, the, the signal arm works as follows. The vital star entered into the uh, electronic medical record by the nurse. Abnormal vital sign sets are detected by the computer algorithm, really based on service criteria. And then the alert is sent by the EMR to a PDA, uh, held by a car caregiver in, in our institution. We started with an iPod, moved to an iPhone, but there's some various configurations and various devices that can be used. And the caregiver is, is the charge nurse, and uh, he or she will, will get the alert right away, go to the bedside with the, with the bedside nurse and assess the patient. And, uh, and that's, the, that's the response arm. And they'll depend on how, and their, their response is scale, scalable depending on the degree of patient acuity. They might review in the morning rounds. They might increase the, the uh, vital sign frequency. They often will call the most responsible physician or decide to call the rapid response team directly. And it's often a, a trigger for end of life discussions as well for, for, uh, for some patients. Immediate benefits we saw when we deployed the system in 2014, we saw uh, better um, communication between the day and night uh, shifts. So one charge, the charge nurse from the day, for example, will give the device over to the night nurse and say, you know what, uh, patients A, B, and C triggered uh, alerts today. Uh, can you just have an extra on them overnight? Uh, so there's, there's a sense of mastery uh, for, for these uh, team leaders. They know who's sick on the wards. They don't have to hear about it secondhand. And when the nurses call the physicians, um, you know, after a few months of ingraining this, this system, the communication was enhanced and the physicians now understood, you know what, their uh, nurse will call them and say, we got an alert on this patient. The physician now understands what that means. They're talking the same language. Uh, this, this is sort of the, just the pathway of how a patient may deteriorate and then how we want to stop that deterioration uh, early uh, by noticing these alerts and responding to them. So again, not a lot of uh, significant increase in workload. The number of new alerts uh, is manageable if you have a system that decentralizes it, that keeps it more specific. To refine it, uh, we added some uh, triggers for neurologic deterioration using an AVPU score, which uh, has been used in some jurisdictions. So glasses-coma scale is a, bit, is a bit of work and has some calculation in it. So for non-neuro nurses, um, this, this uh, AVPU system is, is fairly easy and been validated as well. Uh, getting the rapid response team criteria that our hospitals use into the early warning system algorithm was also uh, key, um, and if you're going to this way, uh, don't necessarily have to make the call. The the alert will tell you to make the call, which is which is helpful. And uh, our outcomes, so our one-year results uh, on six pilot wards, we saw a 35% reduction in code blues, an 18% reduction in unplanned ICU admissions, and about four, two to four lives saved each month across the organization. We expanded uh, in 2015 to the remainder of the medical and surgical inpatient uh, units. Um, when doing this as a QI project, the nice part you get uh, ward specific rates of code blues, deaths, IC transfers, so very granular uh, data that, that's very helpful so you can compare ward to ward over time. Sustainability, we we're interested in one to make sure that our nice results weren't uh, a one off. And uh, this graph shows you the, the decrease in code blues uh, per thousand admissions uh, with our metric at uh, the two hospitals, uh, Bratton and Civic Hospital, the Total General Hospital, uh, over time. So we found a nice uh, sustained decrease over the last few years. And with that, um, you know, we, we see that our rapid response team new consult activity has increased a little bit of a drop in 2016, but they did increase overall since 2013. And it's probably the driver of our improved outcomes with, with the system, I think. And uh, looking at the hospital standardized mortality ratio of the HSMR over time, we saw uh, a nice uh, decrease over time. Um, this, this, again, maybe probably is multifactorial, lots of good things. Uh, you know, and lots of good quality work happening in these institutions, but uh, hopefully uh, we can take at least uh, some of the credit there. And uh, this is a summary slide, and uh, thank you for your time and attention today. 
Thank you very much, Dr. Milliton. Uh, certainly a lot of information to process. If anyone has any questions or comments, feel free to put them in the chat box. Uh, we may have time for a couple, but we'll have to see how close we are to the top of the hour. And uh, just given the delay, we may end up bleeding into the next hour uh, if there's some good questions that do pop up. Next, we'll invite uh, Sabina Robin to speak. Sabina, the floor is yours. Thank you. Well, thank you, Michael, for sharing that great work happening at William Osler. As a patient, I can tell you I truly appreciate the efforts you and your team are doing in implementing the early warning system. Noting the significance of failure to recognize the deterioration patient, as Joanna mentioned in the beginning of the call, I would like to tell you about the outcomes of a project I am working on with CPSI and HIROC. So we came together about a year and a half ago to brainstorm on how we might work together to get some tools and resources into the hands of the public, providers, and leaders to either help be better informed about deteriorating patient condition or to support local improvement efforts regarding deteriorating patient condition. So we conducted a gray and white literature review and met with a number of people who we consider to be trailblazers in this subject area, one of whom was Michael Milliton. We then curated content, wanting to profile the great work already happening to make it available on CPSI's Shift to Safety platform for others to learn from and use. Hoping this may be a help to you and your team, I'd like to point out some of that content. So what you're seeing here is the landing page. You can access this by searching deteriorating patient condition on the CPSI's website. As well, the link to the page is available here in the chat box if you'd like to explore some of the content along with me. Here to the right, you will see four tabs, which open into tools and resources specific to public, provider, or leader. Additionally, you will also see here a list of recommended readings for scholarly articles divided into helpful sections. You are also able to access a video of Matea's story. You're certainly welcome to use this at any time. Let's go back and have a closer look at the public tab. One of the tools I'd like to highlight here for the public is the top 10 signs of a rapidly declining patient. It is a helpful tool to help create public awareness. Now, let's take a look at the provider section. So we divided this into, so, <clears throat> excuse me, we divided this into several sections according to the evidence and the outcomes of our literature review. Let's have a closer look inside the general care setting tab. Okay, here you will see resources to share with your patients. some provider resources, as well as reference to key contacts, including definition. As you can see, the site is very user-friendly, and we trust you will find it helpful. Again, if you're looking for any of these resources on the CPSS website, just enter deteriorating patient condition in the search field at the Canadian Patient Safety Institute.ca or contact us at info at cpsi-icsp.ca. Thank you. Now I'll turn it back to Jason. Hopefully we can get in some questions. Thank you very much, Sabina. Uh, we do have a few questions that have come in and a few minutes left to spare, so we'll see if we can uh, get through them as quickly as possible. Uh, there was one question just around uh, the acronym CCRT that was used in your presentation, Michael. Uh, can you just confirm what CCRT stands for? Sure. Uh, critical Care Response Team, uh, sometimes known as a Rapid Response Team or a Medical Emergency Team. Sorry about the uh, algorithm. Uh, sorry, the, the uh, acronym. Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, one more question for you. Uh, this person asks, if someone is an athlete and has a low heart rate, usually um, 40 to 60 beats per minute, for example, uh, what heart rate would indicate that they are getting into difficulty? Um, 
a good question. Um, probably somewhere below their uh, their baseline, perhaps 20% below their baseline, although I think it really depends on what the clinical situation is, um, what other medications they might be on. Um, so there can be confounding factors, so that's a, that's a bit of a difficult one, but generally um, the heart rate is, I would consider as uh, one part of an overall assessment of the patient and, um, you know, perhaps one clue to what's going on, but sometimes the heart rate in and of itself um, can be difficult to use without knowing the rest of the story. Great. We also had a couple of questions around uh, rapid response teams in either smaller organizations uh, or in community uh, care settings, for example, long-term care, home care, um, and wh where they, they likely wouldn't have a traditional rapid response team. Uh, is there any suggestions or anywhere we can, we can point people who are looking to, to perhaps implement this on a smaller scale? Um, I, I don't have any information about um, rapid response teams in long-term care settings, and I don't think there's uh, any literature, at least uh, I know about uh, supporting that. However, um, there are a variety in, in acute care settings. Um, there are different permutations of rapid response teams. Uh, for example, in the UK, we see uh, most, of, most of the rapid response teams out there have, are, are in fact nurse-led. Um, some rapid response teams are led by respiratory therapists in other jurisdictions. Uh, they're not always uh, physician-led. Like I said, in the UK, they're, they're often nurse-led, usually uh, a nurse with critical care training. Um, but again, with a lot of this is really recognition of deteriorating patients, and uh, there's lots of resources out there, including your own, um, that um, you know, facilitate the knowledge transfer. Um, so this is not a rocket science. Um, I think most people with the acute care, you know, healthcare background uh, can learn this. Um, but of course, the trick is, is always in the implementation. Okay, great. Uh, and we do have one more here. Um, this person asked if there's been consideration to mandate hospitals to extend their rapid response teams to be called by patients and families rather than by clinicians only? Uh, I, I think that's um, the move is afoot with that, uh, that it really depends on the, the jurisdiction. There, there's some uh, place in the world where, yes, that's, that's uh, families can activate teams in other parts. It's, it's a clinician um, that, that will do that, uh, you know, a physician, nurse, a respiratory therapist, et cetera. Uh, it really depends uh, where you are in the world. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, with that, we'll bring today's call to a close. So thank you very much to everyone for joining us on the line. Thank you very much to our speakers for taking the time to be with us and share your knowledge and your stories. Um, this recording, or this webinar rather, is being recorded. It will be online within a week. So if, if you missed it or wanted to revisit it, uh, perhaps missed the beginning, uh, you can always uh, find it on our website, patientsafetyinstitute.ca. Once you log off the WebEx, you'll be prompted to take a quick survey, and I encourage you each to do that. Your feedback helps us with future calls. Thank you very much for joining us today, and have a good rest of your day.